Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning through your Son, Jesus. We come to acknowledge that you are an awesome God, a faithful God. You are the creator of this world. You are the creator of mankind. And you designed us out of dust. You put us together. And in your image, you made us, each one of us. And you made us so that we would know and we would share the glory of your love. Lord, we thank you. You are a gracious God. You, you're a God who knows each of us inside out. You know us much better than we know ourselves. Because not only do you know our thoughts and our feelings, Lord, you also know our potential, especially in your hands. And so for your love for each of us, we know it goes beyond all we could ever imagine. And so, Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us for the times, even today, when we've put something else before spending time with you. Father, this morning as we bow in praise and worship in this service, please open afresh our eyes, our ears, renew our hearts, our minds, our lives, so that we will give you the praise in the things we speak and do. We do ask us in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior and Redeemer, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I have two readings this morning. The first one is from Matthew chapter 14. And we will be looking and reading the verses Mark 22 to 33. That's Matthew chapter 14. This is God's word. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Amen. Can I ask boys and girls that want to come up to the front and I'm going to come down.
Good morning. Oh. Sorry, George. You've got to look after these women. I understand that. I've got an envelope in my pocket. And in this envelope, I've got three things that are valuable. Okay? They're of different values, but they're still all necessary. Anybody, any ideas what it is? I can see all these screwed up faces. What's he talking about? What do you think's in here? Any ideas? You see the smiles come to your faces whenever I bring it out. It's money. It's a five pound note. It's a ten pound note. And it's a twenty pound note. And for the cynics, no, the Queen didn't blink whenever I brought them out of my wallet. Now, every one of those is valuable. I could do some things with that. Not a lot nowadays, but I could do some things with that. And I could do more. I could do nearly twice as much with that one. And I'm going to do twice as much again with this one. They're all valuable. So there's a value on them. They're worth something. Now, if I screw it up, I throw it down. I know you're not going to jump on it. I'm watching you, George. And I screw this one up and throw it down. And I screw this one up and throw it down. Are they still valuable? What are they worth? Still the same. It, it didn't make any difference to them, did it? Well, what if I... What if I take my wee bag and in my wee bag I have another bag it's got mucky stuff in it I like to do a bit of gardening well I don't really do gardening I've got an allotment plot I'm not a farmer like most of the people here what if I was up there and my notes fell in to the ground and they got all muckied up does the value change are they still worth the same thing yeah this is where I make a mess what if I who I'm well known for my Coke Zero. What if I drop some of it? No. And I, I dropped some of it in there. So it get all wet as well as mucky. Is it still worth the same? hasn't changed any, has it? There's still a five-pound note, a ten-pound note, and a twenty-pound note. And yes, I brought a towel. What if I take them out one by one and clean them up Dry them down. They're a wee bit scruffy looking. A wee bit stained. But is that still the same? okay James I haven't put anything on the cap it dry and clean is that one still the same
And this one's still the same. Now, what if I put them back in the envelope? It's still a five pound. Yep. I can't buy anything less with it because I put it in muck or water. Can I? No, still the same. And it's still a 10 pound. I can't buy any less with it. And the 20 pound, I can't buy any less with it. And I'm going to put them into the envelope. And put the envelope back in my pocket. Tell me. Will it do any good in my pocket? What do I need to do with them for them to do good? To be really worth what they're, they're supposed to? You see, on each one of them, there's a number of words. And you see up on the screen, it should come up showing you each of them there. And on that, there's the words that says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds, 20 pounds, 10 pounds. It, it says that on all of them. But for that promise to be kept, what do I have to do with those? Spend them. Yeah, I've got to use them. You know, those notes are a bit like us. Whenever we're very young, there's only a certain few things that we can do. And as we get older, we can do a few more things. And as we get much older, we can do a lot more things. And I discovered that there's a 50 pound note. And I was going to bring one of those, but there's nobody here that does as much as that. So I didn't see a point. So we could do those things. God sees every one of us. And he says we're valuable to him. And we can do lots of things for him. Whether we're small or we're bigger or much older. And he has promised that one of the things we can be is we can be his children. He wants us to be his children. And when we're his children, then he will give us little jobs to do. And he will help us. And he'll look after us. We don't need to be afraid. He says he will look after us and keep us safe. But do you know something? Before all that happens, there's one thing we have got to do. We have got to accept his promise. All the stuff set out here on the table. This morning's communion. We remember that Jesus died with our sins. And for us to accept those promises and for those promises to mean something, we have got to accept Jesus as our Savior. We have got to recognize that he died for us. It's no point knowing the promises. It's no point having those pound notes. Well, five, ten, twenty. Unless we go by the promise. We've got to accept the promise. And we've got to reach out. I'm going to pray. Father, you have promised so much to us. And we can only embrace those promises, we can only accept those promises, which will always be there, will always be true whenever we accept your son Jesus as our Savior. When we accept that he died for us on that cross and it was our sins that put him there. Now I pray that as we come here this morning on communion morning that we would remember that 
and we wouldn't be expecting you to look after us whenever we won't accept your son. Lord, I pray you'll be with the boys and girls that are here. Hold them safe and bring them to accept your son, Jesus. They are valuable to you. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be able to use them whenever they accept and become your children. Amen. We're going to sing, I'm special because God has loved me. Boys and girls like to go out to this church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you call us to offer thanks in not for, but in all circumstances. And this morning we again ask that you would strengthen, help, uphold us with your righteous right hand. But we pray that you would grant us grace and freedom to love well in times of chaos to pray and to reach out to those of us bearing the weight of health concerns for ourselves, for those we love. Lord, grant us grace, peace, and the assurance of your nearness. Lord, we ask for those who are weighed down by a combination of world news, as what's been going on in one place has moved to another. We think of everything that's happening in Israel and the Palestine, Palestine um, territories and how justice has turned to revenge and more people have died unnecessarily. We think of those here who are suffering from financial pressures 
because everything is getting dearer. Vocational issues. Relational heartaches. Lord, we pray that you would grant us grace and a renewed vision of your occupied throne of heaven. Leaders here may come and go, but your throne will always have the king of kings on it. Lord, we pray for those of us who hear the condemning whispers of Satan. And they seem louder than the consoling voice of your son, Jesus. Lord, grant us grace and fresh assurance that nothing can separate us from your love. That Jesus plus nothing When he said it is finished, he didn't say half of it is finished. He said it was completely all finished. And we pray that Jesus, we would recognize as our righteousness. Father, in these and other scenarios of difficult circumstances, reassure us that you are very much at work in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' merciful and mighty name we pray. Amen. Second reading is from the book of Joshua. The very first verse of Joshua. It's the sixth book in the Old Testament. And reading from verses marked 1 to 11. This is God's word. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I have given every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon. And from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers. To give them. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. Go through the camp and tell the people. Get your supplies ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan. Here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God has given you for your own. Amen. And Lord, we pray for your hand upon these your words, and they may be written on each one of us. We stand to sing again. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.
Why are we here this morning? Today's communion. And I know some people who have spoken to me and have decided not to be here because it's communion. There's others, and they felt they had to make this special effort to be here this morning because it's communion. And I wonder, I wonder, what do you expect from coming to church, especially today? But I also wonder, where does God fit in when we talk about church? I think that's one that should have been in the children's one. Thanks, Malcolm. You're only checking to see if I'm still awake. I'm actually looking at these. Let me change the subject slightly. What's your motivation to keep doing what you're doing? And again, let me ask that question. Where does God fit in? It's amazing the number of times I visit homes and I hear about faith, I hear about church. (coughs) Even people who are here every Sunday. And the question I've got to ask is, yeah, but sorry, where does God fit in? At the start of our reading in Joshua 1, we're informed that Moses was dead. God's appointing Joshua to take over as his servant. You see, Moses was the leader when God delivered the plagues in Egypt. He was the leader when God parted the Red Sea. He, Moses, struck a rock and water came out whenever the people were thirsty. And can you imagine how Joshua must have felt when he was told, you're taking over from Moses. You're the guys in charge as we go into this new land. And with all those challenges ahead moving into this new land, what do you think would be the motivation to keep Joshua going on that journey ahead? It's not going to be an easy journey. There's going to be lots of opposition. And I want you to hold those thoughts. What's his motivation? Over the past 10 years, My life has taken many twists and turns, as well as ups and downs. Over the last 10 years, God has led me through new phases in my my life's journey. And I say ups and downs because there's been a number of highs, but there's also been a number of deep lows. And yet, through it all, I have seen God's hand in everything. I may not have recognized it at the time, But I saw him opening doors and paths that in my mind didn't exist. I saw him opening doors and paths that if I'm honest, there were ones that I didn't want to go through, that I didn't want to go down. But looking back, they were the correct paths. Because you see, God never gets it wrong. And in those deep Lows, he carried me. We've heard of many times about the footsteps in the sand. And we have said, why when tough, there's only one set. Where were you? And he says, that's me, your man, because I'm carrying you. He led me. He was always there. He surrounded me by praying people during those deep low times. I was once told that to serve God, I needed to accept John 3.16. And Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. I needed to learn to trust God. To trust him and to follow Jesus. I was told it won't be easy. But remember, he always keeps true to his word. And you know, it's fact. I find that. And you see, friends, in this world there is a tendency for us to seek explanations for why and what we have to do. Sorry, why do I have to do that? So that would just happen. Why did that happen? And we expect, we examine what we're told and the replies just to ensure that we feel comfortable with those instructions. 
And we do it before we decide what we're going to do. And if honest, we regularly prefer comfort and status quo than following God. We depend on us, not him. And friends, as Christians on mission in this world, we must be prepared to face dangers that can prevent us from living by the promises that God has set for us. Note I said face them. Because you see, the first promise, or the first danger I see is that one of looking back. Moses is mentioned six times in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. He's, he's mentioned 57 times in the book of Joshua. And it's very easy to look at what God has done in the past and wonder, why isn't it still happening? Or think, we know better than others. So I forget all that. This is what we should do. Lot's wife made that mistake. She looked back. She was, told not, she was told to look forward. And maybe she was thinking of those left behind in Sodom. I don't know why. You see, there is a danger in wanting to continually look back to the comfort zones that we had. Instead of looking forward to see what God is doing in our life, we want to look back. Instead of looking to see what God is doing in our church, we want to look back. And for 40 years, Moses was the only leader the people of Israel ever had. And now there's a new leader. What are the people going to do about that? What is Joshua going to do about that? Does he just do the same things as Moses? Let's look back. Oh, yes, this is what he did when that happened. This is what he did. No. You see, it actually, Joshua leads in a completely different way. The people will learn that. Because with God, the only constant thing are the promises, not the explanations. God says, I give you a promise. Follow me. And in these opening two verses of Joshua chapter 1, they stress the importance of living with our backs to the past. What is it God says? Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, arise. Let's get moving. Matthew 14, 26. We discover the old fisherman's suspicions that whenever the weather is bad, ghosts come to claim lives. And in a sense, they were looking back at their old practices. When they thought they saw a ghost walking across the water. And what did Jesus say in verse 27? Take courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. And I wonder, are we willing to live with our backs to the past? Are we willing to challenge people to live looking forward with Jesus? Not in our own strength, but in his. Are we willing to look forward with God's promises to build his church? Or do we look around and say, well, there's nothing wrong with this building? But then, of course, there is always the danger of standing still. Verse 3. You see, fulfilling the promises of God requires that we walk by faith. God wants us to keep moving with him. And when we stand still, we sink or we go backwards. You see, God's promises are for today. Not for yesterday, but for today. And when we claim them, they may have come from our past. But they're always for the future. What was it that happened in Matthew? Looking for reassurance. Peter shouts, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. He's prepared to put his faith in Jesus and to get out of the boat. None of the others joined in. None of the others asked Jesus to call him. And here we find Jesus making a promise. He says, come. Peter stepped out. He stepped out of his relative comfort zone. He took Jesus at his word and he got out of that boat. Notice it's when 
Peter starts to look around and when he starts to think about the worldly things around him, the waves and the wind, that he stops, he stands still and the waves pull him under. The other disciples weren't walking. They were standing still in the boat. Christian friends, the danger is when we stand still, we're going to question the promises of Jesus, the promises of God. I'm not talking about times of stillness with God. I'm talking about times when we stop trusting. And I wonder, are you serving God? Or are you standing still? Because you don't like what's ahead. Sometimes we want to stop, especially at tough times. We want to stand still. We want to rethink the past. And that's when we're going to sink. And we've got to be careful that in standing still, we aren't actually, first five, giving up. You see, Joshua had many challenges ahead of him. There were 31 kings waiting for him. And sometimes it can be very difficult serving God. But we have a God who never promises to leave us. He never promises it's going to be easy. But he never promises to leave us. Genesis 28 verse 15. 31 verse 3. 46 verses 2 and 3. We find God continually encouraging Jacob. He says I will always be with you. And I believe when we look at Jacob. We look at Joshua. They had the same feelings of loneliness. They felt like giving up on their journey. And God reassured them as he reassures us that he will always be with us. I mentioned a minute ago about the danger of standing still. It becomes giving up. Because when God is calling us to move forward, then in a sense we're giving up on what he promises, giving up on what he requires us to do when we stand still. Recently I heard many calls for the church to remain in locations where they were traditionally seen and known, doing what they are traditionally seen doing. And I think we've got to be careful because I wonder when we do that, are we, are we in danger of falling short? Verse 6. Verse 6. God talks about inheritance. The land that he promised. And in this journey, the Israelites have been going. I see three geographical positions. And unless we claim where God has given us, where he has taken us, by outwardly following him, then we have fallen short. We will remain in our Egypt. We will remain in our wilderness, but we'll never reach Canaan. What does that mean? Well, okay. E Egypt. Egypt represents the world system. A, a system that keeps us in bondage. And you know, we can put into slavery, we can be put into slavery by this world, by a freshly nature. The Israelites were in slavery in Egypt. They were freed from their slavery by the blood of a lamb. And so each and every one of us, spiritually speaking, has been in Egypt. We were born there in spiritual slavery. And Jesus delivered us from that slavery by dying for each and every one of us on that cross. The wilderness, the wilderness is the inability to believe God's promises. He sent 10 spies. And when they came back, they said, it is, it is as God said, but it's interesting when we go right through to the end of the book of Numbers of the 12 spies or 10 spies that went in. 12 spies went in and 10 said, but they never got to the promised land. They died en route. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, who said, let us go. 
You see, they never denied the promises of God. They just didn't believe they could claim them. And friends, there are many times when the church is wandering in the wilderness because we refuse to claim God's promises. We're not denying them. We just don't want to claim them. And when we do claim them, Canaan, just as our earthly fathers give us an inheritance, God gives us an inheritance, a renewed relationship with him. He gives us, through Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary, eternal life. Note that God didn't say, I will give you. He says, I have given you. You see, the same is true today, friends. Whenever we choose to step out of our comfort zone boat, we will see God leading us. And I wonder, where do you want to put your soul? What's your desire for growth of God's church? I wonder how many here today are still spiritually in Egypt in the slavery of sin. And many here today are wandering around the wilderness seeking the comfort of the past or explanations for present disturbances. Reasons for not reaching Canaan and where God is leading us. You see, this morning, I wonder, are you stuck with biased thoughts of hurt, past hurts or joys? Instead of saying, I believe you, Lord. I'm stepping out to go wherever you... To do whatever you're calling me for. And then positively praying for others around the church. Not just for our friends, but for all others around the church. The final warning that I see is in verses 7 to 9. And that's the danger of taking over. God said to us basically, remember, you're working for me. I will give you the words and I will give you the things to do. And sometimes along the way we think we can do that better. Now if we did this, we'd get the same place. God calls it pride. Pride gets us into trouble. Pride keeps you going in the opposite direction. And what keeps us from getting proud? Spending time with God and his word. Privately and as a church. You see, whenever we claim the promises of God, it requires that we start the day with his word. The book of the law is the place of the promises of God. The book of the law was the Bible that Joshua knew. The Old Testament was the Bible that Jesus read. The entire Bible that we have is the book that God has given to us. And we can't serve God without claiming his promises. And we can't claim his promises without knowing them. And we can't know them without reading them in the book. He says we prepare to come to the Lord's table. A table open to all who love the Lord. Not those who's got their name in a book and have to give in wee tokens. Open to all who love the Lord in sincerity and truth. All who recognize Jesus as their Savior. All who are by the Holy Spirit daily seeking to follow God's leading. Leading. That's what that table's open for. And I want us to remember, what was it Peter called? Jesus said to Peter, come. He took his eyes off Jesus. He started to sink. Jesus caught him. Friends, you, you don't need to get your feet wet to walk on water. But you do need to get out of the boat. And when required, Jesus will catch us whenever things are rough and we're sinking. He will still the storms around us when our trust is in him, not ourselves. Uh, let me finish with this question. Question from the start. What keeps you going? What's your motivation to keep doing what you're doing? Self-praise? Why do you come here? 
And where does God come in any or all of those answers? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, by your life, death and resurrection, you have become the ultimate peacemaker. And we praise you for being our hostility destroyer, our relationship healing saviour. We thank you for securing us in a perfect relationship with your Father. And because of your finished work, Lord, we, we no longer need to live with fear, with doubt about what God thinks about us. Lord, we, we not only enjoy unbroken access to our Father, but we are assured of his great delight, constant pursuit for us to be walking in his footsteps, in your footsteps. And even when he must discipline us, times whenever we offer resistance, it, it's done with a heart of love, not disgust or aggravation. Lord, teach us that. Forgive us when we look back, when we stand still, we give up, we fall short, or we try to take over. Forgive us when we choose resentment over reconciliation, when we choose nursing grudges over building bridges, when we choose to seek revenge and not justice, or we rehearse our hurts quicker than we remember the gospel. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us when we think there's something we can do to fuel you to regret or renege on your promises and then we can feel guilt-free. Forgive us our arrogance and our own belief which infects every cell of our being. And Lord, not only forgive us, change us. We pray that you would change us by the same grace you justified us sanctified us, making us more like Jesus. And we pray that by the same Spirit who brought new life to our hearts, that that Spirit would extend new life through us into our church, into our town, into this world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing, standing on the promises of Christ our King.
box if you get your communion tokens out. The elders will come round and collect them. As I said, this is the Lord's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's not a Randallstown OC table. It's the Lord's table. It's a table he has prepared for all who trust in him alone for their salvation. It's a table to which we invite all who love the Lord in sincerity and in truth. Beloved in the Lord, let me read the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as spoken by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses Mark 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on themselves. Paul reminds us that when our Lord had given thanks, he broke the bread. And following his example, let us give thanks. Father, we thank you for your grace and your love. We thank you in that while we were still sinners, you did call us to be your children, not because of anything we have done or could do, but because of what your Son has already completed through his death on Calvary. There he became our sacrifice, sacrifice for our sins, past, present, and future. And Lord, we thank you that through his resurrection on the third day, showing victory over death, we can see life after physical death. And so, Father, with a repentant heart, a broken, repentant heart, we accept your gift of life and we ask that you would bless us as we partake of these elements, bread and wine, elements that represent your son's body broken and his blood shed for us. Amen. As is the practice, when each of the elements are delivered, we hold them until everyone has been served, and then we take them together. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him.
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take, drink all of it. This cup is a new covenant in the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. Do this in remembrance of him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. May I remind committee members and elders to please wait just for a few moments after the service. Let us stand as we sing, Yet not I, but Christ in me.
And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.